It's a film with one of the most famous twist endings of all time, so spoilers ahead for people who haven't seen the film. In a not particularly appealing future, a detective investigates a murder, but along the way uncovers a conspiracy to hide a sickening truth. And no, it's not the sickening truth that Auntie Beryl dips her churros in Marmite. How could I ever imagine? Soylent Green. In Richard Fleischer's grim and bleak 1973 film Soylent Green, overpopulation and environmental degradation has led to 40 million people living in New York City in the year 2022. For reference, the actual population of NYC in actual 2022 is around 8.5 million, or 4 million if you take away all of the people actually in a Starbucks right now. People are sandwiched together like pieces of bread stuck to cold meat, though actual food is nigh on impossible for most people to even dream of seeing. Beef, Miss Cheryl. And also, it's damn hot. Many people subsist on processed soy food blocks, the most popular being varieties of Soylent products, the popular plankton-based Soylent Green variety, which is in such short supply, eBay scalpers are making a killing. Who needs Taco Tuesday when Tuesday is Soylent Green Day? Police detective Thorne has a small apartment that he shares with Sol, a police book, basically a researcher and bookworm, since no one seems to have access to computers in this world. A man is found brutally murdered in his ultra-exclusive luxury apartment and Thorne is assigned to investigate. He finds Sherl, the apartment's built-in concubine, known in this world as furniture. Furniture? Yes. Suddenly, a trip to Ikea has taken on a whole new meaning. After looting the place... What did you take? Everything I could lay my hands on. Thorne's instinct tells him the murder was no bungled burglary, because he would know, but an assassination. The victim, Simonson, was a high up in the Soylent Corporation, the company that controls much of the world's food supply. It's not bad. Tasteless, orderless crud. As one would sit in an armchair to relax, Thorne avails himself of the furniture Sherl's services, with the two falling for each other. The furniture analogy is fascinating, but does raise difficult questions about, I don't know, furniture removalists, furniture polish, and if you want to get really kinky, upholstery. Soylent representatives lean on Thorne's boss to close the Simonson investigation, but Thorne resists, getting stuck with riot duty as a punishment. Okay, in a world where a hockey team winning or losing a game sets the fans on a downtown rampage, we might chalk that up to either high spirits or high consumption of spirits. But here, when the Soylent Green runs out, shit gets real. The supply of Soylent Green has been exhausted. One of the enduring images of the film was the use of scoops to deal with food riots. Basically a dump truck with a scoop on the front. It does seem like it might be a little ineffective since half the rioters fall off the scoop. Also, once they have been scooped, there doesn't seem to be any compelling reason to stay in the back of the truck. And it also seems to be needlessly dangerous to use in a crowded situation since... <laughs> Even though every video we post has a spoiler warning in the teaser, this film is just one that, if you've never seen Soylent Green and somehow have not been exposed to the famous ending and don't want to be spoiled, it is really time to go and watch something else. Okay, wise guy. Soul consults with the exchange, basically a bunch of retirees who don't play bridge canasta or mahjong, but are more or less the ultimate repositories of knowledge. In this world, they're the equivalent of a 1997 GeoCities homepage, which is just a series of links to other web pages. The members of the exchange glean from a confidential Soylent study that Earth's oceans are dying, meaning that there's nowhere near enough plankton needed to make the Soylent products. I see the words. But I can't believe them. Who are? This is getting all a bit grim, isn't it? It's like reading my high school report cards. Bless me, Father, for I have sinned. It has been six months since my last confession. It's clear someone's out to get Thorne as he gets closer to uncovering the truth. And every person we encounter who does know the truth seems to be incredibly down about it. Yet not one of them is in their car filming themselves ranting and foaming at the mouth. I don't want to hear any more about it. Can't hear anymore about it. Sol, meanwhile, has had enough and treats himself to a last hurrah in a clinic before he's euthanized. He manages to tell Thorne the dark secret before departing. I love you, Thorne. I love you, sir. His last words get the proof, and then he dies. It does sound like Sol really hadn't thought through his plan all that well. 
After following the path taken by Sol's body, Thorne confirms for himself the terrible truth. In lieu of plankton, Soylent are getting their protein from somewhere a little closer to home. After a shootout, Thorne confirms what everyone else seems to know. Soylent green is made out of people. And shit, that's the last time I eat peppermint wafers. So, spoilers, how about spoiler warnings? Every now and then, somebody will comment on the caption we place at the start of our videos, warning of spoilers, even when it's a fairly old film or TV series. It's usually along the lines of why. Necessary. Just because you've seen it, or I've seen it, it doesn't mean everyone who watches this channel has seen it. And people discover old movies or TV all the time, or fill in a gap of something that they may have missed. So, a spoiler warning really costs nothing. To be forewarned is to be forearmed. Of course, to be forearmed is to be someone who will either require the services of a really good surgeon or a really good tailor. Soylent Green was based on Harry Harrison's 1966 novel Make Room, Make Room, but this film makes several changes. The film turns an accidental killing into part of a conspiracy to hide a dark secret. In the novel, there's no Soylent Green, but there are Soylent Stakes. The title was changed partly to make it snappier, but also to avoid audiences confusing it with the original title of the Danny Thomas show, Make Room for Daddy. Though upon reflection, given the cannibalistic overtones, Make Room for Daddy might have actually worked in a very dark and meta way. Soylent Green was one of the last films shot on the MGM lot before most of it was redeveloped. The streets of a decaying New York look suitably grim. Most people look grubby and sweaty, while the rich folk live in air-conditioned comfort and eat real food. The contrast is well done. It can be a heavy-handed film in places, but like most sci-fi of the early 70s, there is a warning of some kind. You can heed the messages or be an ostrich who can't work out why they have sand in their ears. The film shows a corrupt society with mega corporations running roughshod over everyone else. Though in their defense, most of the suits wear some really natty hats. Director Richard Fleischer was, of course, the son of famed animator Max Fleischer, but had already been a successful director over a long career, helming hits and failures in a filmography that, before Soylent Green, included 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, Compulsion, Fantastic Voyage, Doctor Doolittle, The Boston Strangler, and Tora Tora Tora. The direction is solid for the most part. Dramatic scenes are handled well enough, though the cop movie parts aren't anything particularly special. Depicting the future is always fraught. The only electronic device in the entire film is a computer space machine, which was one of the earliest electronic video games to be found in arcades. It wasn't a massive success, but its creators would go on to bigger success with their next venture, a simpler coin-operated tennis game called Pong, for their new company, Atari. F**k Atari. Charlton Heston does a little more emoting than usual. Thorne's just trying to keep his head above water, with a little light looting to try and get by. The film was 30s movie star Edward G. Robinson's final role. Sol remembers how things were, and weeps at the sight of fresh meat, and how things had gotten to this point. How do we come to this? Joseph Cotton, Lee Taylor Young, Brock Peters, and Chuck Connors all give good performances. But this is a Cheston joint. Soylent Green was the last of a trio of science fiction films starring Heston that started with Planet of the Apes, ignoring his brief appearance in the sequel, and the 1971 feature The Omega Man. And Omega. A small planet in the Omega system. Yes, Omega. How does he know about the Omega-13 device? Access secured data file Omega-1. In Soylent Green, unlike those other films, his character starts off as somebody trying to make the best of an awful situation. Like Auntie Beryl when she realised there was an open bar at the wedding of her ex-husband to her best friend. The film veers between really, really depressing but very interesting speculative fiction and a fairly standard early 70s action movie with cops and shootouts. It is one of the better science fiction movies of the early 70s, and along with Westworld, probably has the most enduring legacy. The ending was a reference, then it was cornball, then a meme, now it's just iconic. Possibly the weirdest legacy of the film is that someone unironically made a dude bro soy meal replacement and called it Soylent. To me, that's a bit like naming a housing development Raccoon City. Soylent Green is good speculative fiction. It's entertaining, has a core idea that's fascinating as well as grim, the world building is done fairly well, and has very good performances. The ending will stick with you like used chewing gum in your hair. You gotta tell him! Silent Green is people! If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe, leave a comment below, or check out some of our other videos.
remember tuesday is silent green day